be beginning shortly. Okay, um, thank you so much for joining the Education Policy Centre tonight uh, for King's Think Tank. Who, uh, we're hosting Dr. Etanad Mahana Matar from the LSE tonight. She um, is an assistant professor, we're a research fellow with the LSE Middle East Centre. And she's, con she's been conducting and is currently conducting research on Salafist youth in Tunisia and its radicalization process of subjectification. In 2013, she managed a regional research project fostered by, uh, funded by Artifam GB and run by the LSE's Middle East Center in five um, Arabic countries on the women's political participation across the Arab region. Um, prior to that, her research concentrated on the historical trajectory of Gazan women's uh, religiosity, agency, and subjectivity. And tonight she'll be talking to us about the experience of radicalization and de-radicalization de de um, that she's been studying um, and her, pr her proposed policy recommendations um, in tackling it. So if everyone can please welcome her um, to present her research. I prefer to stand while I do my presentation and I feel more like that. Free. Um, first, uh, I would like to thank um, King Sank uh, Think Tank for uh, giving me this opportunity to share uh, my research uh, with you, and I thank you so much for using it, your time to come and uh, listen to me and uh, contribute to, uh, I think, a controversial uh, topic on radicalization and the radicalization. Um, I'm myself Palestinian, so I've been not only researching uh, religiosity or radicalization, the radicalization, but I've been uh, part of people's experience, day-to-day -day experiences, whether in Gaza or in, in Tunisia. Um, my uh, research is different than maybe the mainstream literatures and media reports on radicalization and de-radicalization. I mean, we all know that there is a, a vast, uh, vast, vast amount of multidisciplinary literature investigating strategies of radicalization and de-radicalization of Muslim youth, not only in the West, in Middle East and other Muslim majority and minority uh, countries. Uh, However, there is li still little uh, empirical uh, evidence um, reflecting or e ex uh, ex examining the um, actual experiences of, of radical uh, Muslim uh, youth um, and, and how they have been experiencing their radicalization and their radicalization um, in their own countries or even those who travel to Syria, Libya or other uh, countries to join um, jihadist group. In my research, I attempt to challenge state-led re rehabilitation approach to de-radicalization by exploring a new approach uh, or a new model of, of de-radicalization that happens from within uh, uh, radical groups, so radical Salafi jihadi groups. Um, that is not actually um, given enough concern and attention not only by researchers but also by policymakers and practitioners of counter uh, radicalization. So I will talk about the uh, 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 my argument and the counter uh, 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 the uh, major arguments that I try to challenge and my counter uh, arguments that result from the empirical data and empirical analysis. Uh, my research objective is to examine how youth experience, uh, experiences of engagement with radicalism contribute to de-radicalization. Uh, meaning at what limit of experience of radicalism a youth become potential to de-radicalize themselves. Uh, to achieve uh, this uh, or my research uh, objectives, as I always do, not only with this research, with all my previous uh, empirical and ethnographic studies, I go to uh, uh, my field research free of prior assumptions. It doesn't mean that I get into the field with free mind. 
but three broad assumptions that are considered the major problem of studying radicalization and de-radicalization. Uh, free of judgment and free of um, certain views about radical uh, uh, Salafi use and leave it for the empirical investigation to give me answers to uh, uh, several questions or to uh, meet or answer my research uh, questions. But I also get into the field with the belief that there is something missing. Uh, or something that not yet examined in existing literature with the belief that there is something wrong with the uh, uh, policies, existing policies of, of counter-radicalization that uh, is proof that uh, most of them uh, led to uh, counterproductive uh, effects. Uh, my research also uh, doesn't seek uh, generalization because um, I believe the process of radicalization and de-radicalization and, and their outcome um, is not linear and it doesn't uh, 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 provide um, um, uh, definite outcomes or progressive outcomes due to uh, differences um, as well as changes in context because the context is always changing and also uh, due to differences and, and changes in radical groups enter and interrelational dynamics and individual personal and interpersonal experiences. So to meet my research objectives, I specify my target, my research participants. I only, um, I only uh, target uh, or targeted individual Salafis who shifted from being radical, whether belong to jihadist groups, particularly in Tunisia, it's called Ansar Sharia during my research uh, period, or sympathizing uh, Ansar Sharia. Um, those who shifted from being radical or involved in jihadist groups supporting jihadist uh, ideology to pragmatic, sh adopting a reformist interpretation of Salafism, which does not only um, they they did not only uh, do not only denounce violence but also gradually de-radicalize their religious um, attitudes and uh, social uh, behaviors. The research also, uh, the, 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 uh, the research sample or research participants are uh, young men and women in a particular age group, 22 to 32, which, which uh, is the age that Salafis were very much involved in activism, not only in, Tun in Tunisia, but in, in other countries. I specify only Salafis uh, from low to middle class background with high education and stable employment um, in order to isolate their experience of radicalization and de-radicalization from those who are socially marginalized and presented in mainstream secular media, whether in Tunisia or uh, in the West as they are. Uh, cognitively, socially vulnerable, so they are brainwashed and they are definitely going to a violent jihadi uh, discourse or, or approach. Um, I relied on a qualitative method of personal narrative, focusing on one question, and because I had previous experience of communicating with radical men and women, so I didn't face difficulties to raise one major question and then building a conversation based on this general question. My general question that I, I asked in the beginning of each interview is why and how have you become a Salafi and what changes happen throughout your experience of engagement with Salafism? Um, I actually focus on, first of all, I ask a general question in order to leave space for flow <coughs> of information reflecting their experiences and every one of them in the first interview presented so many things in a confused way and not structured, non-structural way and that was uh, uh, normal. I met every one of my research participants from three to four times in a, uh, a 
and, and their homes, in their uh, workplace, even in cafes. And um, I mean, Mon, I mean, I always start the interviews in a way presenting my identity as a Gazan woman, as a woman who were involved in national struggle for Palestine, etc. And that that was actually the main uh, research identity or researcher identity that facilitated the uh, 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 generation of information and created a trust with my uh, research participants. So I focused during the interviews and the sequence of events, encounters, for example, what happened when you started and then they presented certain activities they were involved in and then they changed their views towards certain activities. So I asked them why and how you uh, explain that. So. Through this conversation, I, I spend uh, from 90 to 100 minutes in each uh, interview with each um, research for participants. So the total uh, time that I spend with each one, the average total time is, is not less, less than four hours. So, um, you know, I, I just want to maybe some of you are not familiar with Salafism, so I thought to just give an idea about Salafism and how Salafism is defined in Tunisia in particular. So, uh, as it's shown in, in, the, in the slide, Salafism is uh, broadly defined as an intellectual current in Sunni Islam which calls for return to authentic Islam, to the political moral practice of, of first Muslims or the companions of Prophet. Uh, Muhammad uh, uh, to be the primary, uh, not only the primary, but the exclusive source of ethical and eventually political uh, guidance. However, the application of Salafism has varied across the Arab world and worldwide due to changes in political circumstances, structures of power within individual countries in the regions and at the international level. Salafism in, is, in Tunisia is not completely uh, divorced from, uh, you know, uh, Salafism uh, worldwide. Uh, it's been influenced and affected by the uh, wider doctrinal uh, definition used by other Salafist movements in the region, by Wahhabism. And, um, but, I mean, researchers in Tunisia and also leaders of, for example, Nahda, uh, uh, activists give me a specific uh, definition connected to the particular history of uh, of uh, Islamist movement in Tunisia and the changing political uh, scene or agendas. So Salafism in Tunisia has been understood as um, uh, diverse, according to some uh, researchers, as a diverse collection of religiously ultra-conservative individuals who doctrinally positioned themselves in the right uh, or to the right of uh, Tunisia uh, moderate Islamist party uh, in number. However, Salafism or Salafist in Tunisia, like in other countries, is not a homogeneous group. They are basically divided into two uh, currents. The first is Salafia Almiya or scrip uh, scripturalist uh, Salafist who uh, generally, do not believe in, um, in in formal politics or get involved in formal politics, but they don't also believe in violence and they focus on dawa and mobilization of Muslims in order to reach their ultimate goal of establishing khil Khalifat or Islamic State. But, I mean, after the Tunisian Revolution, uh, two years of the Tunisian Revolution, uh, some of the uh, uh, Salafi al-Almiya decided to establish or get involved in, in formal politics and establish uh, some political parties like Islam Party or Reform uh, Front. They uh, actually participated in uh, the last uh, legislative elections in 2014. Uh, one of their uh, leaders, um, I interviewed him and he, I asked him why they decided to shift from being out of formal politics and to being part of formal politics, um, the, they, they said, we aim to catch the Salafist support 
and turn it into electoral and, uh, and political capital to be used to attain the most significant political goal, the application of Sharia in Tunis. So it's the changes in their strategies for achieving uh, the same uh, goal. The second group is Jihadi Salafis, and they represent basically in uh, Tunisia uh, Ansar uh, al-Sharia. Ansar al-Sharia, like other jihadist groups, um, uh, believes that jihad or violent jihad is a religious a duties and Muslims have to get involved in it and it's a responsibility of everyone. Never tells even jihadists uh, in Tunisia, they have different views. Some of them believe that jihad does not necessarily include violence. Some others believe that jihad is a duty outside of Tunisia, not inside of Tunisia. Uh, and there are so much debate about it, especially during the uh, my research period, which is 2014, 2015. Um, I, to give enough time for um, discussion, I prefer to uh, skip the historical and contextual factors of rising uh, Salafism in, in Tunisia. Uh, there are several uh, factors, the pushing factors, uh, uh, that um, provoke Tunisians to get involved in Salafism as a revolutionary action, which I will talk about it later. Uh, and there are post-revolution polling factors, uh, especially in the first two years of the um, uh, after the Tunisian revolutions, where <coughs> Salafis deliberately and uh, wisely uh, uh, invested in the civic freedom attained by, uh, by the uh, Tunisian uh, revolution. And actually, uh, by end of 2012, I mean, they controlled a large number of mosques in Tunisia. But I mean, <sighs> Until the end of 2013 and the beginning of 2014, during the political crisis and the uh, so much fighting against the Nahda uh, led government or Troika government, at the end, Nahda resigned and uh, a new technocratic government led by secular uh, individuals or uh, Mahdi Juma. Uh, uh, in early uh, 2014, the uh, Tunisian government started to actually to revive the previous anti-terror policies and try to show a new uh, brutal uh, uh, government crackdown against Salafism. Um, starting from February, March, from March 2014, um, some of the aspects happened with no trial, with no uh, convincing reason. They closed a large number of, uh, of charity organizations or some suspended uh, them. They arrested a large number of Salafis who were uh, involved in, in Dawa uh, organization. Um, and, and they uh, prevented so many uh, Salafi activists, uh, whether do, they uh, belong to Ansar Sharia or not, uh, to uh, practice their uh, charity work and providing food support to people in, in need and in internal regions or south of, of Tunisia. In July 2015, the Tunisian parliament approved a new anti-terror bill allowing authorities to detain terror suspects for up to 15 days without access to a lawyer. By 20, late 2015, the Ministry of Religious Affairs, within the uh, rhetoric of you know, counter-radicalization, uh, the Ministry of Religious Affairs had a control over mosques in Tunisia, of over over all mosques in Tunis, mosques in Tunisia, they uh, fired all uh, imams who even there is a little suspicious about them that they support uh, Salafi groups, whether jihadi or non-jihadi, violent or non-violent, and they replaced them with authorized uh, clerics and and imams. 
um, and they started to shape uh, uh, religious knowledge in a way that did not at, at that time but they still doing the same did not allow uh, not only Salafis but ordinary Muslim Tunisian to know anything about religion except the CDs distributed by or authorized by the ministry uh, or the, no, no, CDs uh, and sermons uh, even sermons in, in uh, Friday, uh, Friday uh, prayers that used to be uh, permitted by the government before uh, imams go and, and say anything. Um, at that uh, time, I mean, none of people who I interviewed were allowed to do any uh, DAO activities or to get involved in any uh, charitable uh, activities. Um, during that period, I mean, according to my observation during the research period, because it was not an easy, you know, task to do research with Salafis or with radical, with jihadi uh, Tunisians. Um, so Salafi, uh, during the, the period of April to December 2014, where I was there uh, for, for months, Salafis were hidden from the public. And, and this sentence was actually said by the interviewees themselves. They, they said to me, see, you can't see any Salafis in the street. Uh, trying to avoid being continuously chased by security forces, and even those with beards, and it has to be Islamic beard, you know, there are different between Islamic beard and non-Islamic beard, they used to be chased by security forces. Some of them were arrested. And I tried to find evidence, not only to listen to those um, who said these stories to me. So they were not only chased by security forces, um, they were harassed by ordinary people who hate Salafists and think that they are the only uh, threat against security. Large number of, of uh, Salafists who belong to Ansar Sharia, the Jean Jihadist group in Libya, Syria, and Iraq, according to official uh, records, which you know gives, I think, a reflection of the actual changes happen. Uh, the number of Tunisian youth joined jihadist groups has doubled in the period 2014-2015 uh, to 5,500 Tunisian fighters in Syria, in Syria and Iraq. And I'm not sure about this number, but that's again from official uh, sources. 15,000 were uh, prevented to travel to Syria. Maybe. I guess in, involving uh, uh, family members who wanted to, you know, unite with their either husbands or maybe brothers. Um, okay, so this is, you know, the background of the context of, of my research. Now I'm uh, going to uh, present the finding, the empirical findings of my research. Um, I did my research, as I mentioned to you, within a hostile context against Salafism. But uh, I succeeded to compile personal narratives of 28 Salafi men and women, 18 men and uh, 10 women. Uh, around 85% around of them, like 12 uh, men uh, and 7 women, were radicalized before the uh, Tunisian uprising. So they belong to Salafism before uh, the Tunisian uprising. The uh, analysis of the personal narratives of the 28 Salafi men and women show that they all have gone through four phases of radicalization and de-radicalization. Of course, with differences in the details, the intensity of experiences. Uh, for example, most women I interviewed, they were involved in preaching uh, with, with other women's groups. Uh, but a large number of men who I interviewed uh, were imams uh, and preachers, and very active preachers with charismatic uh, uh, leadership characters and also um, 
a long experience of, of activism and well equipped with Islamic knowledge. Uh, most, most of them uh, have, have an uh, in-depth knowledge of Islam from before uh, the Tunisian uprising. So, uh, I'm, in my presentation, I, uh, I'm not getting involved in any theoretical analysis, I try to avoid it because it's more uh, about policy. But it's, I think, important to present the way I present radicalization, the radicalization process into four phases according to the empirical data I collected. So I have four phases. The first phase is most uh, the interviews, if not all of them, in terms of details, they got radicalized by rejecting the secular identity on both imposed on them by the old regime, by Ben Ali regime, and of course Burkeba before him. Uh, they affirm that the process of becoming, um, yeah, the process of becoming a radical Salafi began with a desire to reclaim that Tunisians uh, had been prohibited to be under the ruling of Ben Ali and his corrupted regime. And in Arabic, we say, some of them I hear some uh, speaks Arabic. In Arabic, we say, and this is what uh, uh, the interviewees said, uh, So they were prohibited to practice their Islamic identity, their trad Islamic traditions. So that created a uh, resentment against uh, uh, Ben Ali regime and the identity he tried to impose, which is more, as they always describe it, French-oriented, French identity is not, it's an aligned identity, it's not our identity. According to youth uh, narratives, their radicalization was not initially based on religious knowledge. Rather, it was a means to resist against the state's oppressive norms and policies and the aligned French-oriented secular identity and it, uh, that uh, was imposed uh, on them by Ben Ali. Uh, Ziad, um, one of the interviewees, I mean, <coughs> there are so many uh, quotations in my uh, research, but for the limited time I have, I selected only one illustration here and there. Uh, uh, Ahmed um, said, uh, we hold the name Salafi to express our anger of the deviant and corrupted behaviors that we see everywhere uh, around us. Ziad, who experienced torture from the Ben Ali uh, police, uh, said it was the police brutality that motivated me to search more about Salafism and to find out why Ben Ali feared uh, Islamists. The second uh, phase, which um, reveals publicly in the first two years after the uh, Tunisian uprising or revolution, Uh, youth at, at this phase, youth still had little experience of relationship with the Salafi doctrine and practice, and their knowledge was not yet consolidated because, I mean, uh, Ben Ali uh, didn't allow there was surveillance of any books about Salafism, jihadism, or even religious books were not easily uh, accessible uh, during Ben Ali uh, era. Um, Salafi youth were, uh, uh, so they adopted Salafism before the uh, Tunisian revolution, but they did not actualize it in their day-to-day -day life. So they were so angry that they couldn't even able to express their image and their views about the world within the uh, Salafi uh, ideology. Um, they were spiritually concerned about the stylization of their new identity while there was civic uh, freedom and every, everyone was able to do uh, and, and express um, um, his or her beliefs. So it was an attempt to actualize 
their self identity and their day to day life. <coughs> <coughs> Uh, and of course, maybe you're familiar with this. This stylization of Salafi identity was illustrated of raising beards, changing uh, appearance. I refused. I mean, some men are so brave. I mean, some of them used to smoke and drink alcohol, and they stop these um, behaviors in order to present themselves as ideal uh, Salafis. As it is expressed by the interviewees, they were so passionate of the new style of life and its rhetoric, its repetition in their daily uh, practice, and the power they were wielding in their local communities and the freedom of exercising their religious agency. And they were so happy young men in 20, mid 20s presenting themselves as they are for the first time in their entire life respected by older men and you know the Tunisian society or tradition of Tunisian society is still uh, a patriarchal society older men and older women also more uh, respected than uh, in the society and they are given uh, a great uh, uh, respect and account um, so at this phase, Salafi youth have not uh, uh, yet generated enough experience to question the val validity and the applicability of their Salafi jihadi uh, identity means to, to decide to what extent this radical jihadi identity that they were enjoying for a, a certain period of time. Uh, uh, it would or has the potential to make actual change in their life and, and to meet their desire to change, to build an Islamic state uh, ruled by Sharia, which is not only a, a belief, but they present it in a very romanticized way. So that is the second phase. The third phase, yeah, I, I presented some give uh, some examples here about quotes from the interviewees. Maybe that you will find it interesting. Uh, this Ahlam, um, she, she was so excited about, I mean, to become ideal uh, Salafi and struggle uh, for building uh, an Islamic state ruled by Sharia was uh, a dream was not only a goal, but a desire that uh, led some of them to sacrifice so many important things in their life. And they were aware about it. And uh, I still remember that woman who said crazily, and she loved to me, she said, I thought that was um, a way to become an ideal. Um, Another woman talked about uh, niqab, and they, they spent, I mean, two women talked about niqab. And open, uh, I think, I remember, we spent maybe the whole interview talking about the way the decision was taken. I mean, it was rationalized. Uh, and, and there was an article about also Salafis, the rationalization of irrational. They, I mean, this woman, for example, Ghada, I, I still, uh, have a contact with her. She was trying in a several way, and she told me she spent months until she decided to put it on. And trying to find reason, strong reason, convince her mind, her brain, to put the, uh, and I think it makes sense. I mean, okay, it, it doesn't seem there is, it's obligatory, but I love it. And, and I think, one of the gaps in literatures on radicalization that they don't give enough attention to studying desires. It's, it's not only reasons that make us take a certain choice in life. It's a desire that is connected with the changing context that we live in and the way we like our identity to be shaped. Okay, so the third uh, phase, in order to have time for um, discussion, 
experimenting radical Salafi uh, identity. Uh, by, you know, as I, I mentioned, with the new uh, the government crackdown on anti-terror policies, um, uh, Salafis or radical Salafis uh, started to feel that they are uh, started to feel the uh, emergence of a new form of subjugation, subjection, subjection that is described by them as much harsher than Ben Ali's regime. The interviewees have started to question the applicability of their radical Salafi jihadi identity to meet their desired change within the changing context of, of power. Uh, to continue, I mean, what, what, what this means is to continue with their activism to achieve their ultimate goal of building an Islamic state. So, of course, the reaction to anti-terror policy has several uh, directions, and, and Salafi youth have taken different uh, ways. Some of them become more radicalized, as I mentioned, further radicalized, and they join and travel to join uh, jihadist groups. My research interviewees, um, they problematized their jihadi identity. I realized that it is no longer applicable to meet their desired change. That was the moment the problematization itself, the questioning of the applicability of their jihadi identity was the moment when they started to gradually de-radicalize their Salafi identity without abandoning the whole Salafi ideology. The fourth, um, uh, the fourth uh, phase is the radicalization process itself, or the radicalization from within. The radicalization in the case of my interviewees is not purely an individualistic task taken in isolation from their connection with other radical Salafis and from the changing social and political context. It is out an outcome of combination of all, state repression and personal and interpersonal experiences among Salafi jihadi groups. And I select just one uh, case for illustration. The most interesting, attractive man I met in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hamid um, is a university graduate. See, I also said, mm, he's very attractive. <laughs> so, um, Hamid is a university graduate, age 32 years old. He owns a business and he has two young children. Uh, he was an imam of a jihadi mosque for six months and uh, supportive of Ansar Sharia during the first three years after the revolution. He said, he has a, his long, long narrations uh, is presented in my article. He said, we Salafists are proud of our religion and we self-sacrifice for it. We need to live in dignity under the commands of God. However, I have learned from my painful experience with jihadists and non-jihadi Salafists that to advocate for our beliefs, we have to stop our extremist thought and practice and avoid being isolated by the stigma of unjustifiable justifi justifiable uh, violence. By questioning the ideology of, um, uh, the ideological legitimacy of uh, using violence, and he's very well equipped with, with Islamic knowledge, by jihadist groups, Hamid was accused by jihadists that he betrayed the Salafi doctrine and as a result, they may legitimize violence against him. Hamid confirmed during the interview that it was not his fear from the state's oppression. He already experienced that before, so he's not scared of state arresting him or torturing him. It's not the state oppression that urged him to rethink his jihadi ideology, but his anger from jihadi youth who are so stubborn and refuse to listen to rational thought. At that moment, Hamid started to feel threatened, personally threatened. 
from within the jihadi groups which made him distance himself from all jihadi groups and started to rethink the politics of Salafism as a whole. The last interview I had with Hamid was December of, uh, 2014 and he was still thinking, he refused to get involved in any of non, uh, non-violent uh, Salafi groups or uh, Salafi uh, uh, parties. Uh, unless, until he develops a new vision of Salafism that is uh, different than uh, jihadi uh, groups. Um, on the other side, interpersonal experience with jihadi Salafi fellows uh, has played an important role in de-radicalization, particularly among uh, uh, young women who's in, in their middle, uh, in, in mid-twenties. Uh, uh, Fatma is a fem- female Salafi aged 22 years old. She used to support Ansar Sharia and believed that jihad is a religious duty. She was arrested by the police with a conviction of supporting jihadists. The police forced her to remove her niqab. However, that was not the main reason that urged her to disengage with jihadists. During her embarrassment, imprisonment and after her release Fatma did not receive any support from any of her Salafi uh, jihadi uh, grew, uh, uh, fellows. She was emotionally shocked and started to question the trust, trustworthiness of those people, I mean jihadi uh, Salafis. Never tells the interviewed Salafis who had abandoned radical Salafism, those who I presented uh, through the uh, phases, four phases, they assert that they have been treated by the state as the same way as radical Salafis and continuously chased by security forces and some of them arrested. Uh, Ziad was arrested several times. Um, and, and, uh, and thereby impinging their ability to express their alternative Salafi way of thinking and acting. From their point of view, this gives legitimacy for radical Salafis to accuse them of betrayal of the Salafi doctrine and um, to justify violence against them. In this situation, as stated by several interviewees, the radicalized Salafis have three options. They may go back to radicalism as it happened with Muslim Brotherhood. Okay, uh, isolate themselves from the public to avoid chasing by security forces or being co-opted by state. Um, either way, de-radicalized Salafis would be denied their right to express their ideas and to potentially contribute to de-radicalization. In terms of my argumentation, um, as I mentioned to you, I try to challenge the state-led rehabilitation approaches and the perception of radical Salafis or jihadists as they are all vulnerable, uh, cognitively and socially vulnerable. My argument are there are um, yeah radicals. Uh, my arguments basically is one. There is high possibility for radicals to self-radicalize uh, by reflection on their own experience. Radicals have the capacity to be critical of their radical Islamic identities uh, without necessarily following a government-authorized version of Islam. Uh, de-radicalization from within is conditioned with the space of freedom for a Salafi to exercise uh, his uh, her uh, critical agency and to learn from his her experiences and the experiences of others in the context of Tunisia as everywhere else. When the space of freedom narrows, the possibility for individual to reconstruct their identity, whether it's radical or non-radical, Salafi or non-Salafi, religious or non-religious, also narrows, and the possibility of further radicalization most likely widens. Uh, I, I put a number of recommendations that hopefully will be uh, maybe the focus of, of discussion, but I want to, maybe some of, you, some of you may think that my arguments or my approach to de-radicalization as it is, it is presented in my research 
suggest that we need to wait until Muslim youth get engaged in violence and realize by their uh, experience the ineligibility of their radical identity? The answer, of course, is not. And here are a number of recommendations that I I think policymakers and practitioners of counter uh, terrorism or counter uh, radicalization have to take them into account. Um, the first recommendation fear of government crackdown did not grant Salafi freedom to experiment with alternative means of political engagement. So, freedom of religious expression is so important. Encouragement of de radicalized Salafis, or maybe in the case. In, in Europe or other countries, returnees, um, to be involved in public activism is an effective strategy of de-radicalization. Uh, balance state control over the religious sphere uh, through allowing all nonviolent religious actors a voice, including de-radicalized Salafis. And the last recommendation, uh, government and non-government actors of counter-extremism coordinate, cooperate with de-radicalized, or here in Europe, for example, with returnees, uh, to invest in their experience to develop a new strategies of de-radicalization. And thank you, and apologize for the long uh, presentation. I don't know how long, how many um, minutes we have for discussion. Uh, 10, 10, 10, 15 for questions. Um, if you want to. 15 yeah. minutes? 15. 15? Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Um, if anyone has any questions, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for that. Really uh, appreciated the presentation. Uh, just a question regarding Tunisia. If I, if I understand correctly, they've had the most number of recruits for ISIS um, from Tunisia. Um, the the move from uh, um, just um, uh, the move into uh, violent jihadism. What was the trigger point for Tunisians? Why did they move into violence? Was it government repression or was it something else? Uh, there are similar, uh, several several um, factors that pushed uh, many uh, Tunisian uh, young men, basically young men, to. Uh, join ISIS. So only one of my interviewees uh, were a returnee from ISIS. And the reason for that is, one, they were under pressure uh, from the government. They were not allowed to uh, move freely uh, and express their beliefs in their <coughs> communities. Their families uh, feel, uh, felt scared on their children, so they didn't allow to use them uh, laptops or um, uh, mobiles or put more restri restriction on their uh, freedom. And uh, another reason is materialism. As my interviewee mentioned, uh, several interviewees mentioned that many of the uh, young men who joined ISIS, they were opportunists. And of course, I can't generalize because some of my interviewees were also involved in, in Ansar Sharia. They were not uh, engaged in violence, but they were engaged in, in radical attitudes and radical uh, social behaviors. And some of them were ready to get involved in violence uh, if they didn't uh, experience jihadism the way they did experience it. So there are several reasons differ from one person to another. Uh, some of them are opportunists, some of them coming from uh, violent backgrounds, that's, that's true, but again, I'm not generalizing. Some of them, uh, which are few, uh, believe on jihad based on uh, dogmatic ideas. Uh, maybe some of them were uh, brain, uh, brainwashed. Uh, the jihadi, uh, the two jihadis, one traveled to Syria and the other one didn't travel to Syria, and both of them de-radicalized. Uh, they were so excited about the idea of murder, uh, getting uh, murders, uh, shahada. 
uh, and uh, then they realized that the way their sheikhs interpreted to them were not true but that was not a religious reason that made them uh, distance themselves from jihadists the groups that disengaged it was more personal one of them lost his friend in Syria during the in, in the battlefield the other one um, discovered the contradiction between the uh, interpretation of Islam the actual practice of it uh, so there is no uh, singular reason that pushed some people to get engaged in violence in ISIS and some others not it depends on the cognitive capacity the uh, uh, the critical agency that they have the way they link their experiences with other people's experiences and try to calculate um, the way or the logic or to rationalize their arguments um, and even in my research 28 the cases I use for my analysis are particular cases and other cases are analyzed or use different framework of analysis for them because they, for example, two uh, of my interviewees became atheists. One became careless, apathist, I define it. But I put them in a, in a different chapter, I published in a different chapter because even there is no singular framework of analysis or one standpoint uh, uh, to analyze uh, radicalization, de-radicalization, because everyone experiences radicalism and, and, and de-radicalization in different <coughs> ways. Some of them uh, enjoy the experience mm -hmm. of getting involved in violence, and some others don't. Uh, maybe personal interests, some of them become leaders and heroes and you know, and some others felt inferior within the uh, uh, jihadi groups. So it's hard to give singular uh, factors. But this, as I said in the beginning, I'm not generalizing. I give you a, just an example of self de-radicalization that also should be considered by policymakers uh, because how can we know about the exp actual experience of jihadists if we don't speak with those who were jihadists, who experienced jihadism themselves? Any other questions? Yeah, um, so how far would you say nationalism was a role in the radicalization or in the political ideology? In, in Tunisia, it is. It is an important. Uh, factor because most of my interviewees were so much angry with, with the uh, national regime, with the authoritarian corrupted regime, and they wanted Tunisia uh, to, uh, to be pure Tunisia, to be ideal Tunisia, to be uh, um, uh, ruled by Sharia from a moral point of view. That was the way they presented. Uh, one of the major reasons uh, for um, getting so angry with the regime and looking at Salafism as a means of resistance against corruption in their national country. Uh, leaders of Ansar Sharia, or some leaders of Ansar Sharia were uh, 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 fighting against the use of violence uh, in 2014 between Abu Ayyad and Idrisi, for example, about how to protect Tunisia from violence and give a priority to preaching uh, Islam or preaching Salafism rather than using violence. So nationalism, I, I believe that it's an important uh, pushing factor uh, in, the, in the case of Tunisia. Uh, and uh, the way they spoke about their experience, okay, they talk about Palestinian-Israeli conflict, they talk about uh, killing uh, Muslim fellows in Afghanistan, Chechnya, etc. But they focus so much on, on, on Tunisia because uh, Tunisian people, maybe this is another reason why um, there are a large number of, uh, of jihadists from Tunisia 
they have been under uh, pressure and have been deprived to practice their Islamic identity in a radical way by Burkiba and then by Ben Ali. And they felt boomed by Salafism as an ideology, as an ideal way to you know, present themselves uh, in a different way for the first time in their post-independent history. Uh, yeah. And so let me summarize what I understand and then ask the question. So it seems from your research that you found that the people, they, they self-explored, that they clearly in some way were predisposed to being radical, and then they went and self-investigated a way to express that radicalism, which then became Salafism. And then they de-radicalized for very personal reasons, that they were um, shocked by you know, the personal interactions or the personal contradictions that they then experienced. But how then can you turn that into a policy? How can you make a policy to uh, kind of enable people to have personal experiences that shows them that there are contradictions, that there are that there is lack of support, that there that they like being radical is not um, like like one of the the interviewees that you had sort of, you couldn't maintain it, sustain it, that how can you translate this into a policy? Um, as, as I mentioned, the most important uh, point or policy recommendation is to, for policymakers and practitioners, they have to look around and find out those who have had experience of radicalization or got involved in jihadism and use their experience as not only as a source of knowledge but those people themselves to be an agent for, for change. Um, because sometimes in some reports in Europe from, uh, I, I can't remember, Sweden or Belgium, Belgium I, I remember, they mentioned that we have to work to get the knowledge about jihadism from the returnees but they perceive them as a, a source of knowledge. Um, but here I'm saying that they are ready to be uh, educators. They are ready to contribute to de-radicalization if they are trusted uh, by um, you know, um, policy makers or by practitioners and do not perceive them as Salafis who are threat even if they de-radicalize, they denounce violence, they are still uh, a source of threat, as, as it happens with uh, Hamid. Hamid kept, you know, he, he was chased by security forces, but he didn't care. He cared about how to use his agency to develop a new vision of Salafism that is accepted and respected and maintain the continuity of Salafi identity. Those people, if they reach to this point of denouncing violence and interested to get involved in formal politics, they are not anymore a threat against security, and they have to get to be involved, not only as a source of knowledge, but as actors, as equal actors in the radicalization program, and to contribute in shaping a more responsive de-radicalization program to the actual uh, 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 conflict within uh, um, uh, jihadi groups. And on one of the points, which I didn't have uh, space to talk about it, the internal conflict within jihadist groups is only known by those who were part of them, who were members, who were involved in these groups. And they are those who manage to, to get disengaged. They are more capable to understand the conflicting dynamics within the groups. And they are more capable to assess how to de-radicalize those radical uh, uh, young men and women. So if they are trained, first of all, if they are secured by state institutions and not uh, chased by security forces, and given a, a, a sense of security and uh, going to 
contribute effectively in rehabilitation programs led by states, they will be much, much more effective than bringing people from above to, uh, you know, uh, de-radicalize or to rehabilitate uh, radical Jews or radical Muslims. Um, so I had a question about, um, you mentioned that a lot of your participants were really highly educated. Um, and how, how do you think their level of education or lack thereof affected their radicalization and de-radicalization? Um, I, I don't deny that education is an important factor, but it's not a determinant factor. So what I'm saying here, in, uh, with, with the uh, research participants I interviewed and I talked with them as, you know, older sister or mother sometime, it's, it's the, na the, the, the nature of the critical agents. It's not the formal education. And the level of Islamic knowledge that they use it to reinterpret Islam in a different circumstances. And why I failed radicalization, de-radicalization, to let you know that we felt and in the beginning, we feel excited about a new ideology. Then we practice it, we exercise it. Then we see and see the effect of exercising a particular identity in our day-to-day -day life. And we see the consequences, if they are positive or negative, and we decide. Here is the critical agency that contribute to the continuity of our changes in the identity and not uh, stop with one particular form of identity. Uh, those people are not only um, critical, but they are brave. Yeah, I mean, Hamid and, and Ziyad, they were chased, uh, interrogated several times, and they were so strong during the interrogation. They don't care because they enjoy being a critical of their uh, self identity. They en enjoy the uh, the changes happen in their attitudes. They enjoy the challenges they make in and, and, and their life. But they need recognition. They need to be supported and respected by those around them. Um, for example, uh, Ziad said, I mean, if secular uh, elites keep not listening to me the, way the, the same way they want me to listen to them, I'm not going to negotiate any ideas with them anymore. So they need to get to be given space. They need to be given a freedom of expressing their alternative way of thinking, as I mentioned, in order to encourage others to do the same. I mean, I think one one of them I mentioned that said if if they are not supported by the state, if they are perceived equally as jihadists, so jihadists will actually find so many reasons to justify the use of violence. I don't know if it makes sense for you or not. I mean, they would blame them, blame the de-radicalized. See, you, you become different, you disengage from us, um, and see, no one care about you. They disrespect you. They still think that you are a monster, etc. you know? So this would give jihadists an excuse to go on. And, and become more and more involved in violence. In uh, Saudi Arabia, there is a de-radicalization program. I think it has been going for like eight or ten years. Um, but with the rating of ISIS, like a small group of those who went back to the society, they became radical again. So Saudi started to be very critical and question, so if they are going back, so why they are giving all these opportunities? So have you encountered any cases yeah, I mean, re-engagement is, is another, another story, and uh, the Saudi rehabilitation program is, I mean, some people criticize it, but I'm saying it's failure. Uh, for several reasons, because first of all, they are rehabilitated under the control of the authority, within uh, a singular vision of Islam, an interpretation of Islam, and with a decontextualization of, of the whole story of radicalism and jihadism. And we always think that radicals are stupid, 
you know, men or women or young men or young women. They are not. I mean, they know how to play around uh, government programs and to show that they de-radicalize in order to release or to be released. And then they go on. This is why I, I present my approach to uh, uh, my approach of self uh, uh, de-radicalization as the most effective uh, approach to de-radicalize other youth. I mean, if you bring someone who's educated, doesn't you know, uh, highly educated elites, uh, seculars to go and de-radicalize young men live in remote areas, in marginalized areas. They won't listen to them, but they would listen to someone who defines himself or herself as a Salafi. And those people do not want to abandon their Salafi identity. Salafism is a moral form of identity. This is how they present it. So keep them holding this identity try to encourage them to present it as a moral form of identity, as a social form of identity, and use it for de-radicalization. It's, it's a very effective uh, mechanism, uh, again, to use to de-radicalize with the uh, uh, de-radicalized uh, people who uh, keep uh, Salafi identity, um, rather than those who become atheists. For example, the young man who decided to become atheist is socially isolated. And, 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 and he, spent, uh, he spent months, couldn't go out of his home, and his parents imposed, uh, uh, you know, encouraged him to go back to uh, God, uh, to go back to praying and uh, practicing Islam. And they thought that he was uh, psychologically sick. Uh, but at the end, in order to integrate himself back into society, he belonged to one of the uh, nationalist uh, political party. That helped him to uh, reintegrate himself into uh, social life and avoid being isolated by his choice to become a it's, it's, I mean, identity construction or reconstruction is, is not an easy thing. It's very complex. And um, when you speak to those people, uh, you understand the way they present themselves, they talk about their experience. It's completely different than reading about them because you don't know who wrote about them and on what perspective. Um, yeah. Um, I think that's all we have time for. Um, can we please thank there's, her? Uh, there's another question? One okay, one more question, but we're question. we're a bit over time, so just one more. Okay. Are there any like, uh, NGO initiatives that are working with you at the Society? Uh, in Tunisia, yeah, no. I mean, uh, the, uh, the last time I contacted <coughs> my country research, uh, participants, maybe two months. One of them was arrested and no one knows where is he. Uh, but unfortunately, no, no one, even the preachers, they had, he was not, not allowed to get in, involved in any uh, da'wah and using his experience to speak with other radicals and jihadis. Uh, no, in Tunisia. Tunisia is, is a very, uh, has a very harsh anti-terror policy. And they don't want to learn from the experience. Uh, although some of them admit that their programs, their counter-radicalization programs are failure and counterproductive. No. But I think in Europe they started to realize that it's important to work with some returnees, but again, as I told you, it, they perceive them as a source of knowledge mm -hmm. more than anything else. Okay, thank you thank so you much. And thank you.